It is my extreme pleasure to uh, welcome you all, but also to welcome uh, our very special author, Leo McKay Jr., author of the novel 26. Um, he's also got a, an incredible uh, book of short stories uh, like this, which was nominated, it was a finalist for the Giller Prize, and uh, a new book coming out, Roll Up the Rim, um, which should be out by the end of December, hopefully. Hopefully before Christmas. Hopefully before Christmas. You'll all want to read that, I'm sure, as well. So without any further ado, I would really like to welcome uh, Neil McCage. Thank you. That was Elizabeth. Yes. Sure. I know Elizabeth. Oh. Yeah. I um, was going to tell a story about about you, but I stopped. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you stopped yourself. <clears throat> Have a seat. Um, well, welcome everybody. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I'm going to read from this book, the cover of which looks a little bit different from that book over there. Um, I'm going to read a couple of shorter sections from the book. And I'll read uh, what's a relatively longer section, I think, <clears throat> and talk about it a little bit. And if there's anybody that wants to ask questions at the end or anything or uh, make a comment, uh, I'm glad to entertain that as well. Um, now, the first uh, section that I'm going to read is a couple of pages from the middle of the novel. <clears throat> but the, um, the novel moves kind of back and forth in time. And so, although this comes from the middle of the novel, it's uh, a scene that takes place kind of early time-wise in the time of the book. Uh, and at the center of the book is um, a relationship between a father and two sons. And w actually both sons get jobs at the mine in the town, which is, the, the mine in the town is based on the Westray Mine in Pictou County, although it, called something else in the book, and the timeline is slightly different. Uh, both sons get a job <clears throat> at the mine, and uh, the scene that I'm about to read is takes place right after they find out they are on at the mine. Now, the sons have had uh, a difficult relationship with their father, and part of that difficulty is because um, the father is an industrial worker and spent his whole life working in industry, and he thinks the, that kind of job is a real job. The, an industry job is a real job. But um, the sons are growing up in a time in Pictou County when there are no industrial jobs to be had, and so they've never been able to get a job to kind of please their father. Um, and so finally, the two sons have been <clears throat> hired at the mine, and uh, for the first time ever, like the father feels proud of them, so they decide to do something together as father and sons go out and get drunk. And uh, they go to this bar. I consider this, even though it's a scene of people fighting, in my weird little world, this is kind of a comic scene in my mind. Um, because the relationship between these people is so fraught and negative. And the scene ends with uh, a broken jukebox. <coughs> The characters, with the exception of one in the novel, are inventions. There's one real character in the book with, whose real name is given. And, um, but there are some, some real things from my real life in the book, growing up in Pictou County. The one thing that's real in this scene is the jukebox, the broken jukebox. It did not appear in the tavern, but when I was... Um, Growing up in the town of Stellarton, uh, the jukebox at Leo's Pool Hall on Ford Street was broken. And uh, no matter what you pressed, it could only play Bad Case of Loving You by Robert Palmer. <laughs> so I thought that was a nice metaphor for the father and son's relationship. It's like no matter what they did, they ended up fighting. And, the, and it ends with the jukebox. and the. And if you were at Leo's Pool Hall and somebody would come in and had never been there, they'd press, they'd go over the jukebox and everybody who was there knew the jukebox was broken. they go, no, no, no. 
and the person would not know what to do. They'd just put their money in and naively press, and it would always be bad case of loving you by rough home. Anyway, so um, the father and sons are at the bar, and they're kind of ordering, and one son decides to leave and go listen to some music. Finally, his sons had begun lives he could understand. So what if they were in their middle 20s? And he had started his working life at 16. They were finally going to do real work. For the first time ever, the three of them were going to do something together. Get drunk. Two more pitchers, he shouted towards the bar. It was a quiet night at the Tartan Tavern. A few people were scattered here and there throughout the room. Most of the action was taking place in the snooker area, where every table was full and the players leaned seriously and quietly over their cues, as though some money might be at stake. Christ, boys, Anna said, when the pitchers he, he'd ordered arrived. He threw back his head in reverie. I remember when I was starting at the car works. He shook his head and laughed. A clatter of snooker balls punctuated his speech. Those were crazy times. We were kids back then, just kids, a lot of us. Quit school in grade seven, eight, nine, start earning your keep young. That's something young people today don't understand. He hadn't meant this as a dig at his sons, but Arbel began to bristle in response. Another thing we don't understand, Arbel said, is how anyone could quit school in junior high and get any job, let alone a good one, let alone keep it, Ziv shook some salt into the palm of his left hand. He prodded the salt with his right index finger, as though counting the grains. Ennis put his beer glass down in front of him. He hunched over it and peered quickly back and forth at his two sons. Those jobs were good jobs because we made them good. We organized and we fought for what we wanted. You think the company was tripping over itself to give us a seniority system, a decent wage, holidays? We got that stuff because we were smart enough to demand it. If young people today aren't happy, it's up to them to fix it. You can only make demands if you have an employer, Arbel said. Who are today's young people going to threaten with a strike? The unemployment office? Their social worker? The parents they're living off? Ziv spilled the salt from his palm over his draft. Foam began rising vigorously to the top. Take this guy, Ennis said, indicating Ziv with his thumb. He's been working at Zeller's for years now. If he's not happy, why doesn't he organize? Get a bargaining committee instead of that employee's relation council he's got. Ziv seemed in no mood for a fight and did not reply to his father's dig. Have you had your head up your arse for 30 years? Arvel continued. Unemployment for people our age is through the fucking roof. Quit your crying. You're crying about unemployment when you're not even unemployed. Ziv spoke up. Look, he found himself saying, we've both got jobs now, good jobs. Why can't we just sit here, drink a few beer, and act like normal people? Why do we always have to jump around each other, screeching like a pack of gorillas? Arvel and Ennis backed off, each of them with a face his own shade of red. I'm going to put on some music, Ziv said. He stood up and jangled the change in his pocket. The boys won't like it, Ennis said. Ziv ignored his father and walked past the pool tables, where the regulars were playing snooker. As he approached the jukebox, the snooker players began yelling, Don't! Don't! Zib made a face in their direction and put three quarters into the slot. He pressed off some songs. No! The snooker players shouted in unison. Zib shook his head at them. As he was sitting back down at the table with Arvel and Ennis, the introduction to Bad Case of Lovin' You by Robert Palmer started up. That's not the song I pressed, Zib said. No matter what you press, that's what it plays, Anna said. That song got played so many times that some kind of groove must have got worn in the machine. That's all it knows how to play now. 
the men at the snooker tables were covering their ears. I guess these guys are pretty sick of this song, Ziv said. The three of them looked at the pool players, who were shouting at Ziv, giving him the figure. Well, they're about to hear it six more times, Ziv said. Anna started to laugh, and his sons joined in. <clears throat> All right, that's that scene. Yeah, that's what I consider a funny scene. People yelling at each other horribly. Um, now, uh, this next scene is a relatively long scene, so I'm going to warn you up front. Um, this scene is kind of, in a way, it's kind of the dramatic heart of the book. Um, I'm getting a little nervous ahead of reading it because it's kind of, it's not an easy scene to read. But Arbel, the character that was just in the other scene, uh, gets killed in the mine. And um, this is the scene leading up to his death. <clears throat> so this is Arbel on his way to work. Actually, where I'm uh, going to start reading, he's just, just arrived at work. So the scene preceding this is him wa walking to work. Uh, he's, he doesn't feel good about his job. Um, it's, it's dangerous at the mine. Um, safety procedures are not being followed. He comes close to deciding not to continue walking to work. He stops part way to work. He actually stops in front of a Tim Hortons. He looks in. He sees people he knows in the Tim Hortons. He sees there's a, there's a guy who was working on his shift who has quit because of safety concerns. And he actually pauses and thinks, ah, I'm going to quit too. And then he just turns around and continues to the mine. So this is him <clears throat> kind of arriving at the mine and, and heading down into the mine. Something had changed in the atmosphere among the men on their shift. They barely spoke to one another. And when they did speak, it was only about things not related to the mine. Curling, or hockey, or hunting. When a sparking engine, or a miner whose methane detectors had been disconnected, or when a foreman or manager ordered them to continue using damaged equipment. The men no longer spoke about these things. They clamped their jaws and shook their heads. The change room was full as Arvel got into his working clothes, coveralls, boots, hard hat. He remembered a film he'd seen in junior high called The Productive Classroom. According to the film, the productive classroom was a silent one. Each student was hunched over an open notebook. The sound of pencils scratching paper and occasionally the sound of a pencil being sharpened. These were the only sounds in the productive classroom. In the productive change room, there was the ripping sound of laces being pulled tight in stiff leather boots. Zippers were being zipped, snaps snapped, Buckles and cinches and Velcro closures were being pulled at and folded over. Arvel held his hard hat in one hand and looked at it strangely before he put it on. His hard hat, the one he held at arm's length every day and examined before putting on, the simplest piece of safety equipment he owned, and one he could have used every day without thought, was an emblem for him. It was like a fossil retrieved from the prehistoric black and white world of his grandparents. But it wasn't like a fossil at all, because fossils were impressions of bygone worlds. And as though having slipped through a hatch in a sci-fi movie, Arvel's pre-past, the world of his grandparents, had been transported forward through time. The helmet with lamp connected him to his own childhood, in which he used to dream of having such a piece of headgear to play with. 
It connected him to a past he'd been told was over. When he'd started school, it was the late 60s. He was the tail end of the baby boom generation. His teachers were the front end of the same boom. And they taught the kids to expect everything. The teachers said Arville and his friends were the luckiest generation ever. They'd never known economic hardship. They'd never known war. They were the children of industrial workers whose 20 years of pay raises had lifted them from impoverished childhoods into the lower reaches of the middle class. By the time he graduated, the teachers were feeling sorry for the students they were sending off into the world. They were the least fortunate generation of the century. Industries were shrinking. The job market was disappearing. They would be the first North American generation to fare worse than their grandparents. <clears throat> Miner's helmet with lamp. These words had been typed in black on a white file card under a glass display case at the old Albion Mines Miner's Museum up the hill from the Albion Field ballpark. He and his friend, Billy Michaels from the Heights, spent two or three weeks worth of afternoons one spring going into the museum after school. The main purpose of each visit was to sign a false name in the guest book. Name, Jesus Christ. Date of visit, 24 AD. Remarks, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Name, Bobby Orr. Date of visit, May 1st, 1971. Remarks, I wish I could play for the Albion Mines Royals, ha ha. <clears throat> the last time they'd gone, Billy had just written Adolf Hitler under name, when the museum's caretaker clamped the two boys around the neck with his bony hands. They both wiggled free and bolted out the door. The old man was George Hanna, a retired miner, a survivor of the Allen Shaft explosion of 1935, a decorated veteran of two wars, a man who wore his Royal Canadian Legion uniform daily, beret clamped over his white bald head, medals and ribbons pinned stiffly to the breast of the jacket. He chased them halfway down Park Street, shouting, No respect for the dead! No respect for the dead! In the time before the caretaker caught on to their silly forgeries, they'd seen a lot of the museum. There were dusty frames full of black and white photos. White men, their faces blackened with dust, black men, skin colored darker, staring steel-eyed at the camera. Some men, unable to stand still for the seconds-long exposures, were smears of black and gray, identified in the accompanying lists of names with a question mark. The pictures of the town of Albion Mines showed streets very different from the ones Arbel knew. Many of the buildings were the same, but time had changed the names of the businesses decorating their fronts, had turned the dirt sidewalks to concrete. When Arbel was a boy, when he was visiting the Miners Museum, the coal pits of Pictou County were all but closed. The McBain Mine in Thorburn closed when he was nine or ten. There was a working pit in Westville. But the mining days depicted in the photos at the museum, when trolleys ran through the busy streets and thousands of men were employed underground, those days were gone. The equipment on display at the museum was of special interest. The pieces were like the relics of a lost civilization. There were instruments that had been designed for procedures no longer carried out. Lamps and picks and shovels and buckets, and hundreds of nameless items for which Arville could not have imagined a use. <clears throat> but the black pit caps with lamps affixed, these held a special fascination, because a ten-year-old boy could think of immediate uses. He, imagines, he imagined himself with the helmet on his head, lamp alight, running through the dark backyards of the Red Row, lighting the ground before him like a locomotive. He tucked the pit cap under his arm, and headed across the change room for the door. Halfway there, he ran into Jerry Taylor, who was just coming up from the night shift. Jerry's face 
His hands and the front of his coveralls were smeared black with coal dust. Sweat had plastered it especially thick just above his eyes. There were streaks sideways across his forehead where he tried to wipe the dust away. He shook his head at Arvel going past. What? Arvel said. You don't want to know, Jerry said. He started taking off his coveralls. You better tell me, Arvel said. They got the fucking methanometer at the miner disconnected. Why? What do you think? The methane levels are so high the fucking thing keeps gassing out. What's Brennan say about it? Brennan? What's that guy ever say? Get the fuck back to work. Taylor turned his furious face away from Arvel and headed toward the showers. When Arvel stepped outside, there was a tractor parked at the portal to the number one deep that already had six men on it waiting to go down. Arvel paused for a moment and looked at the machine. He exhaled sharply, shook his head, then jumped onto the platform at the back of the tractor as it took off down the decline. So much ice had built up on the floor of the 25 degree decline that even on the way down, the tires were having trouble getting a footing. The tractor bounced and hopped on, on the uneven floor. It slid sideways into an arch and a couple of sparks flew off the fender. Get ready for the 4th of July, said Steve Jenkins, who was right beside Arvel and had seen the sparks too. Arvel rolled his eyes and neither of them smiled. There was debris <coughs> piled up on either side of the number one deep. But once they passed the number three crosscut, it got worse. Roof bolts, oily rags, sheets of plastic, empty hydraulic fluid containers, all things that according to the Coal Mines Regulation Act should not have been there. Once in a while, there was a little brown splat that was recognizable as human shit. There was an accumulation of explosive coal dust on the floor of the deep the whole way down. But once they got into the east section, where most of the mining was taking place, the dust was drifted up like black snow. The tractor stopped when they turned onto the number 12 road. With the tractor engine shut off, the corridor was relatively quiet. There was the background hum of the ventilation system and a faint rumble of machinery from somewhere. Their mouths picked up the grit of the stirred dust from the floor and it mixed with the fading taste of diesel exhaust from the tractor. As they began piling off the machine, they saw a light coming toward them from down to number 12. It was Albert Moss, the supervisor. He always chewed juicy <coughs> fruit gum and started every, started every statement with, all right, boys. All right, boys, he said when he got to the front of their tractor. His dentures clacked as he chewed his gum. He gave them their job assignments. <coughs> Fuck, Marvel said when he got his. He'd been promoted to second operator of the miner. Months ago, when he'd just started, this would have seemed like an exciting chance. The miner was where the real production was taking place, where coal was being torn away from the face and conveyed back to a shuttle car. As second operator, he would be a step away from the operator's compartment itself. And running that big, important machine was a challenge he had once looked forward to. But with the methanometer disconnected, the miner would be a hazard. And in this particular drift, they'd been instructed to save some time by not bolting the roof over the miner. This unsafe practice had become so commonplace at East Yard that hardly anyone seemed to give it a second thought. They cut six feet off the face, put in a set of arches, and cut six more feet off the face. The bolter would come in behind them, drilling holes into the roof, inserting resin tubes in the holes, and bolting in place the big mesh screens that would catch a lot of the ground that fell. He'd been working back at the bolter for a few days now, and though using that machine was no picnic either, at the bolter you were at least working under a supported roof. 
John McDonald was the miner operator for the shift. Arbel stood back by the trailing cable and waited for McDonald to come down on a different tractor. Methanometer's been fucked with, Arbel said, when he saw McDonald come round and bend in the number 12. McDonald spat tobacco juice onto his own boot and kicked absently at the trailing cable. The plug in his jaw stood out like an abscess. What do you mean fucked with? Disconnected. McDonald glanced at the idle miner. Gassing out? I met Jerry Taylor up on the surface. They used it last they used it that way all last shift. <coughs> McDonald shook his head. They both looked back up the drift to where the bolter crew was getting ready to start. What about this thing? McDonald gave the vent tube a boot. Working, I guess, Arnold said. And she's still gassing out, according to Jerry. McDonald reached two fingers into his mouth and pulled out the plug of tobacco he'd been sucking on. It oozed red-black juice into his palm a moment before he threw it angrily against the wall. Oh, fuck, he said. He wiped his hand against his overalls. This is typical. Do we operate this fuse while we're in this cannon barrel, or do we get screamed at and maybe fired? Arvel looked at him, shook his head, and shrugged. I say we get screamed at, McDonald said after a long pause. <clears throat> it's all the same to me, Arvel said. We can start now on our own, or we can start later with Brennan screaming at us like a big fat baboon. McDonald had already tucked his gloves into the side pocket of his coveralls and headed back up the drift. He got back on the tractor he'd ridden to the face and set off up the drift to look for Albert Moss. Arbel sat on the idle bolter with the bolter crew and waited for him to come back. You know exactly what's going to happen, said Steve Jenkins. The rest of the crew sat reclined as well as they were able in their respective places and did not respond. Around them, the hum of the ventilation system and the roar of machines being operated a short distance up the ramp vibrated against the walls. He won't come back here with Moss, Jenkins continued. He'll find Moss. Moss will tell him to find Brennan. Brennan will come down here and have a seizure. And the absolute most he'll do will be to reconnect the methanometer and block the vent tube at the bolter, which will make us first to fry instead of you, Jenkins indicated Arvel. It was an hour and ten minutes before the tractor reappeared. Brennan was behind the wheel. John McDonald stood behind him, holding on to the back of the seat. The tractor lurched to a halt, and Brennan's fat body came flying off of it, arms flailing in rage. I can't, I can't, Brennan said, choking on his anger. I cannot fucking believe what I'm seeing. You fucking bunch of worthless pieces of shit punched in over an hour and a half ago, and you've been sitting on your arses ever since. Brennan's face was scarlet. Saliva dripped out the corners of his mouth. Why don't you just sign on for Pogi like you've done all your worthless lives and sit in your fucking living rooms doing nothing? Harville stood up. Brennan instinctively backed up a step in the face of this mass of muscle and bone. Why don't you operate that fucking miner without a methanometer, Arvel said. Brennan clenched and unclenched his fists. He went back to the tractor and took a handheld methanometer from a bag. Arvel stood near him as he took a reading. 3.75%, close to the explosive range. Without looking up at any of the men, Brennan said, his voice strangely calm, reconnect the meter. He walked over to the end of the vent tube near the bolter. Arvel saw Steve Jenkins roll his eyes. We'll need extra suction at the face, so block this tube and get the fuck to work. So we're not going to vent the bolter, Arvel said. No need to vent both machines, Brennan replied. He was already halfway to the tractor. 
his back to the crew. The gas will build up back here, Harville said. The tube with the face will draw it forward, Brennan said. He was not looking anyone in the eye. The bolter's got no methanometer on it. Brennan started up the tractor. It sparked to life and immediately began making a soft knocking and a sort of muscle, muffled, pinging, buzzing sound. The little complaints that an oxygen-starved diesel engine made in a methane-contaminated atmosphere. Arbel ran ahead to the tractor and jumped up beside Brennan. Brennan's face went white and he flinched backwards as though he expected Arbel to hit him. Arbel placed one hand in the center of Brennan's back. The other he placed over the top of both of Brennan's hands where they gripped each other at the crest of the steering wheel. Arbel looked down to where his big left hand was almost as massive as both of Brennan's hands together. Then he looked into Brennan's eyes. If we get killed down here, Arvel said, the tip of his nose was almost touching the tip of Brennan's. He had the man's full attention for the first time ever. Don't expect me back next shift. Arvel hopped down from the tractor and began to laugh. Brennan gave him a startled look, put the tractor in gear, and sped away. <clears throat> what was that? Uh, I have one more paragraph that I'm going to read. Um, this is the very last paragraph in the book. Just going to take a little drink here while I do it. I realized partway through that reading I forgot to give my standard language warning at the beginning. Yeah. <clears throat> I was, uh, uh, I, I heard this British poet read a long time ago named Simon Armitage, and he had a <clears throat> poem that had the F word in it. And he told this great story about going to read in a British high school, what they call high schools in Britain. And he read that poem with the F word in it. And after the reading, the headmaster called him into his office. <laughs> said, young man, at this school, we do not appreciate poems with language in them. <laughs> so it's too late for my language warning. There was language in that. You figured that out. Anyway. Um, there's no language in this last reading. It's one paragraph. This is the last paragraph of the book. Um, it's not a spoiler. There's no spoiler alert if you're working your way through the book. Um, I want to end with this. That... Uh, passage I just read is pretty heavy. Um, I want to end with this because the book, uh, I think the book moves in a positive direction. Um, I deliberately, as I was writing the book, uh, I didn't know, this is the first novel I ever wrote. Um, when I started writing it, I didn't know if I could write a novel or not. I didn't know if it was possible. I needed some guideposts for myself, some things to help my, me on my way through. One of my guideposts through writing the book was <clears throat> the first word was going to be death, and the last word was going to be life. And so through the writing of the book, if I had to ask myself, what the hell is this book even about anymore, if I ever got confused, that's one of the things that kept me on track. It's like, this book begins in death and ends in life. So I'm going to read the last paragraph leading up to the word life. And um, there, there's no, uh, you know, one of the rules uh, of the, that the writers of the Seinfeld series followed, they actually, they only had two rules for their, their scripts for that show. No hugging and no learning. That were the, that's their rules. That's why I love that show so much. Uh, I hope that in this book there is learning. I don't think there's any hugging. So nobody's really hugging at the end. But uh, I think it's a positive ending. Now, the, the, the book ends with the father and son outside in the wilderness. It's a beautiful... 
the uh, winter day, the snow has fallen, the father and son are skiing together, and uh, they're doing something kind of positive together, and the father has been kind of exercising, getting his physical life together. Um, the ending of this book actually takes place in a, in a real spot. It's not in Pictou County. Um, I was about four drafts or five drafts into this book, and I was living in Maitland at the time, Maitland uh, just outside of Truro, and there's a great old road outside of Maitland called the Selma Road, the old Selma Road. There's no, it's the old road, uh, and so there's no traffic on it anymore, um, but it's still kind of a public kind of right of way, so there's this old road cutting through the woods, and you can walk on it and you can ski on it. And I was out there after this incredible snowfall years ago, working away on this book, and it was one of those snowfalls you get late in the winter where the snow is so heavy and so thick that you think the trees are going to collapse under the weight of it. And I was out on this trail on the old Selma Road skiing one day and I was just kind of ecstatic. I was looking all around me uh, and I was like, wow, this is so amazing. And I stopped and went, oh man, this is Right here. Um, so this is the last paragraph. As light creeps into the sky, Zip becomes more aware of the snow-laden trees around him. A few branches have cracked under their burdens, but most are arched gracefully in unaccustomed directions. Big spruces and firs stand over him on either side of the trail. Under the weight of snow, they bend toward the ground. Two white spruces, squared off on opposite sides of the trail, appear to be bowing to each other. The tips of their branches reach out across a lifetime's distance toward the other, ready to shake hands or embrace. Even evergreens are dormant in the winter, Zib knows. Not dead, but the next thing to it. After the coldness of a dark season, one that seems to go on forever, they manage somehow to rekindle within themselves a life. That's what we're working on. Now I came here fully prepared and qualified whatever that means, uh, willing, I guess, to answer questions or take comments or whatever. So I'm, I'm happy to do that now if, if you'd like to do that, but no pressure. So I'll wait. I'm not afraid to wait either for someone to raise their hand and like, make a comment or ask a question. I'm not afraid of silence. Now Steve had his hand up there, sorry. Who was your favorite teacher in high school? Oh, man. Um, I was... I was fortunate to have several uh, really good teachers. Um, Don McKeeman, who taught me grade 12 English, was a big influence on me. He was a very inspiring guy. Um, last night, or two nights ago, I read in Sydney, and um, my, uh, my grade 6 teacher was at the reading, Mr. Murchison, Robert Murchison who uh, was originally from Sydney and uh, taught his whole career in the town of Stellarton. And um, he was at the reading the other night. He was a great positive influence on me as well. He was great because I, I, he taught me in grade six and I used to go see him all the time after that and just drop in on, on him at the end of the day. And if I was <clears throat> feeling gloomy, he'd tell me to keep going. So I was fortunate to have several good teachers. Don McKeeman was awesome. And a few years ago, I read it uh, in the Glasgow Library. He uh, introduced me there. That was that was great. And now you had a question or comment there, didn't you? Yeah. I just wanted to know: Did you know somebody personally that worked for the Westbury Mine? Uh, I knew several people who worked there. Uh, I, as it turned out, I did not know any of the 26 men who died. Uh, but I'm from the town of Stellarton. I was living away at the time, and um, one of the hard things for me at the time of the Westray explosion 
was, uh, I was away, I was far away, um, but the, the mine was relatively new, and the very first thing is, I, I didn't know who I knew who worked there and who didn't, and I was away and I called my parents who were uh, still alive and still living in the town then, and um, at first, the, the, the company didn't know who was underground at first, they didn't keep records of who was underground. Uh, so it took days, really, for me to figure out who was down there and who wasn't. Uh, now, one guy I knew, and I don't know if this was in the Dean, I, I found this out through either reading the Dean Job book, the Dean Job book on Westray, or maybe Sean Comish, who was a Westray miner himself. He wrote a terrific book about Westray, called The Westray Tragedy Miner Story. Um, it's an incredible book. Uh, but one of the, I found out that a guy I knew pretty well and played hockey with when I was a kid was injured in the mine just prior to the explosion. And so, lucky for him, uh, that injury probably saved his life. He was badly injured through another kind of poor safety procedure that was going on at the mine. Uh, he got caught in a conveyor belt and had his leg badly injured uh, and was unable to work to be blown up. So I didn't know anybody personally who died there. Yeah. But I mean, I grew up, the neighborhood in the book, um, it's called the Red Row. That's a real neighborhood. That's the neighborhood I grew up in. Anybody who loves the Red Row and Red Row houses, I have one for sale right now. <laughs> I'm perfectly willing to sell it to you. Talk to me after this reading. Uh, yeah, so I grew up there. And I grew up in a mining company house. The Red Row was mining company house. And Steve grew up in the same neighborhood right around the corner. Um, so I kind of know, I know the area. Yeah. Now, you had a question? Yeah, I have two questions yeah? for you. Uh, number one, when you were researching your book or preparing to write it, did you interview people who had worked in the mine? No, I didn't. Why not? Um, First of all, I, I wanted to make sure that this is a work of fiction. It's not a work of nonfiction. And I wanted to make sure that nobody got... A, a work of fiction has to be the work of the author, the writer of the book. And I did not want to give anybody the false impression that I was going to write their book for them. Yeah. You know. Uh, I did not. I, I I felt I was afraid of that. I was afraid that if somebody thought I was going to write a book and they were going to tell me their story, that they were going to hold me to telling the story that they told me. Uh, and I felt I had to be, be free to write it the way I had to. But also, um, there's been a lot of stuff done about Westray. Um, Two planks and a passion theater did uh, a very uh, kind of popular and well-received play, much-produced play, and I'm not going to remember the name of it. Oh, shoot. Anyway, they did a play that was based entirely upon interviews with family members. It was entirely focused on the family's um, experience. Uh, the uh, Sean Comish, who was a West Ray miner himself, wrote an excellent book that sold a lot of copies called uh, The Westray Story, The Westray Tragedy of Minor Story. Um, and so he told the story from the point of view of the miners there. Uh, Dean Job, who is a, um, was a uh, Chronicle Herald reporter, wrote an excellent book called Calculated Risk. I'm trying to remember these names. Called Calculated Risk. <clears throat> um, so, and, and uh, Justice Richard himself, who did the judicial <coughs> inquiry, the, just, the, the report by Justice Richard is exhaustive. It, it completely tells the story. Um, so, first of all, I did not feel like uh, there was somebody who had to have their story told and it wasn't being told. Right? So, yeah. And do you have another question? Yes. Uh, I wanted to know uh, what uh, writers influence you, whose style do you like? Uh, I've had a lot of heroes. Um, 
as a writer, and I, I kind of have gone through phases in my life, as people tend to do. Um, the first writer who was a huge influence on me a long time ago was an American short story writer named Raymond Carver. And part of his influence was because I was kind of starting to write at a time when his short stories were very influential. A lot of people were influenced by Carver at the time. Um, but the thing that, that the the thing that influenced me about Carver was uh, I, I come from a, a working class background. I, I'm from the neighborhood that's depicted in this book. And I knew that that's the only experience that I could reflect in my work. And at the time, anyway, I could not find writers who I thought were depicting that world the way I experienced it. And I was kind of looking for who writes that seems true to the way I knew that experience growing up. Um, and when I read Raymond Carver, that's what happened. A, a, a kind of light bulb came on. Uh, one, one sentence into the very first Raymond Carver short story. It was, uh, uh, I was a student at the time. I was going to University of British Columbia. I was living in Vancouver. Uh, I went into Duffy Books, which I think is now defunct in Vancouver. I picked the Raymond Carver book, Cathedral, off the shelf. I opened it up to the first story. The story is called Feathers. Um, the uh, opening sentence, I'm, I'm wondering if I can remember it now, but, uh, oh shoot, this friend of mine from work, Bud, he, he asked Ola and me to supper. I didn't know Bud's wife, and he didn't know Fran. That made us even. But I knew there was a little baby at Bud's house. That baby must have been three months old. By the time Bud asked us to supper, where'd those three months go? Hell, where's the time gone since? It's hard to describe what happened to me in that moment. I, I bought the book, I went home, I didn't even finish reading the book. I sat down and I wrote the first draft of the short story that became the title short story in my first collection. Because I just, uh, Raymond Carver was expressing the lives of ordinary people in ordinary language, and he was not getting in the way. One of the problems that happens when, uh, when you get all educated and whatnot, which I am, you know, I, I've got a lot of education, but you learn a lot of kind of fancy language tricks that can get in the way of authenticity. And, uh, reading Carver, and Raymond Carver called himself a paid-up member of the working poor. Raymond Carver spent a big part of his life uh, struggling hard. Um, and, uh, yeah, so Raymond Carver was an early one. But I've gone through many, many phases after that. I really like now, it's got nothing to do with Raymond Carver, but I really like uh, Ian McEwen, British writer. I can't get enough Ian McEwen. I'm one of these people that's like, I don't want to read the new one right away because it's going to be a few years before the next. You know, I, I want to, <laughs> I want to save it so it won't be so long before the next one comes out. Yeah. That's a good question. Thank you. Yes. At first, I'd like to say that some, as someone from away, uh -huh. um, I had a, a nodding acquaintance with the Westray event, um, but had no. No knowledge really other than that it happened. Yeah. Um, and so I appreciate very much the insight that reading this book gave me. I feel like yeah. I really understand it a lot more than I would have, even if I knew a lot of the facts. Yeah. The question that I have is about the character Meta. Yeah. Is she completely fiction? Is, is there a person that she's based on in any way? I, I, I appreciated the, pers the different perspective that yeah. she gave, and I'd like for you to talk about how she connects there to your story. Yeah, um, <clears throat> she grows up in the same neighborhood. Right. There's, not a, there's not a person that she's based on. Um, there are, you know, there are just kind of people I knew who were sort of like her in this way or like her in that way a little bit. Um, but um, to me, and I knew several people who, um, 
kind of grew up in the Red Row, and it's a rough neighborhood. There's rough ends like Steve in it down there. Uh, <coughs> but there are people who somehow managed to kind of rise above all that and just sort of, and I, I knew one person who was way, way older than Meta, who's of a, a, a whole different generation. My great aunt Mary um, was this really gentle, highly refined person. Um, and I just had always had to remind myself, she's from the Red Row. Wow, look at her. Uh, so Meta is a, is a person who kind of wants to kind of rise. She feels oppressed by the Red Row in a way. And one, one of the problems is she lives, she grows up right beside one of the roughest families in the neighborhood. And she's sick of the place. By the time she graduates from high school, she's had enough of the Red Row. Uh, and it's partly because of her immediate neighbors. And now, the neighborhood I grew up in is mining company houses or duplexes. Um, and, um, you know, I was fortunate growing up to have quiet people on the other side of the house. They were not as fortunate. They did not have quiet people on the other side of the house. <laughs> Me. And uh, she just had a heart, you know, and so if you're living basically in the same house with people with major problems. So she tries to kind of get, I, I chose, her name means ambitious. See, I looked her name up. I was like looking for a name for her. I was like, the, the, the subplot with her friend you got. Yeah. Was there any symbolism there that you? Well, I think what happens is she goes to Japan. Um, and that was an important part of this book for me. That was my experience, in a way. I was living in Japan when the West Trade exposure happened. And, um, you know, I thought she was in, um, you know, people have, have asked, like, what, why would those miners have gone into a dangerous situation like that? And one of the things that I'm trying to kind of explore in the book is the conditions that lead to that. And it's this, a similar kind of condition that leads her to flee Canada in a way, to where she can find a decent job for herself. But um, she fought, so she leaves Canada to leave the Red Row behind her because the Red Row is this place. There's this scene where she has the, her neighbor is this, um, f convict guy who's like fleeing from the police and he run and the, the back of the red row house is like my bedroom when I was a kid looked out over our kitchen roof and the neighbor's kitchen roof was right over there and so um, this guy and her neighbor in the middle of the night the police are chasing him and he goes running across the roof and he breaks in right through her bedroom window so she's in bed and she has this convicted felon from next door rummaging through her bedroom, fleeing the police. So she thinks she's getting away from that when she goes to Tokyo, but she's exposed to a whole different kind of violence in Tokyo. And so what I, I didn't want, I didn't want this book to be pointing easy fingers anywhere. There's no easy fingers to be pointed in the world. And um, I didn't want to portray, you know what? Uh, Pickle County is this horrible place and these are horrible things that go on in this horrible neighborhood. She goes to Tokyo, and she's faced with a, as grim a situation as what she was facing at home. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay. Um, it's my pleasure to um, say thank you on behalf of the group. Um, when I read the book and I read the inscription, it says that memory is important or something like that. Yeah, it's dedicated to memory. It's dedicated to memory. And I couldn't think of a better way to memorialize uh, Westray after 20 years or even after 100 years than <clears throat> the uh, piece of fiction you've given us. I read it some time ago and again recently. And um, I think most of the people I talked to when I came into the room um, remembered every, every word and every character and loved every bit. So I think the people of Westray and the people of uh, Stellarton can be very proud, as can all of us Nova Scotians. If I had a fistful or a pocketful of quarters, 
and we had a joke box. <laughs> I would put my quarters in and hope to replay what I just heard. <laughs> good job. Thanks. Oh, good job. <laughs>